adventure. Hi, this is Gabe Ignetti. And this is Rick Maltese. And this is the Eco Modernist Podcast. We live in paradoxical times that are marked by confusion, alienation, and dread. That vision of a Star Trek future that was prevalent in our recent past has been displaced by a dystopian worldview that has permeated our society through movies and the media with an underlying nihilistic message that looks to the future as being a dead end. It is therefore not surprising that across the political spectrum there's a broad yearning for a return to some nostalgic golden age which has led to a widespread rejection of the very idea of progress and modernity with all its technological trappings at precisely the time when it is most needed for the future survival of this planet. Speaking with us today about this modern-day dilemma are Christian Parenti, Jennifer Bernstein, and Lee Phillips. Christian Parenti has a Ph.D. in Sociology and Geography from the London School of Economics and is presently a professor in the Global Liberal Studies Program at New York University. He is a prolific best-selling author. His latest book is Tropic of Chaos, Climate Change and the New Geography of Violence. He has reported extensively from Afghanistan, Iraq, and various parts of Africa, Asia, and Latin America. His articles have appeared in Fortune, The Washington Post, The New York Times, Middle East Report, London Review of Books, Mother Jones, and The Nation. He has won numerous journalistic awards and has received an Emmy nomination for the documentary Fixer, The Taking of Ajmal Naqshbandi. Dr. Jennifer Bernstein is a long-standing environmentalist and lecturer at the University of Southern California, where she analyzes and addresses environmental problems and social justice issues issues. Her research interests are in American environmentalism and Western American environmental history, among other things. She has a long-standing relationship with the Breakthrough Institute, which is an eco-modernist educational organization. Lee Phillips is a science writer and European Union affairs journalist. He has written for Nature, The New Scientist, The Guardian, The Daily Telegraph, The New Statesman, Jacobin, and Scientific American, amongst other outlets. He is the author of Austerity Ecology and the Collapse Porn Addicts, A Defense of Growth, Progress, Industry, and Stuff. I want to welcome you all to the show. Let me start by asking you all this. There are many strains of the environmental movement. Could you all give us a synopsis of what are the different trains of thought out there? You could obviously sort of segment environmentalism a million different ways because every single person thinks of the environment in a different way. So you could theoretically have as many different groups as there are people. On the other hand, depending on how you sort of fix the statistics and the statistical analysis, you could have one big group. But what I found in my dissertation research, which involved some very, very long, weird interviews with lots of different kinds of people, I was basically trying to talk to people who were sort of broadly pro-environmental, but held as different worldviews from one another as possible. I found four main different groups. So of course, you've kind of got the traditional greens and all the trappings of traditional environmentalism, which I think we're going to talk about a lot more during the course of this podcast. But a lot of focus on kind of the grassroots level, a real sort of skepticism toward capitalism, a real faith in the natural, a small-scale technology, if any technology. That's kind of the group that I kind of feel is the real inheritor toward 1960s environmentalism. We all know those folks. I also found a group, I call them the pragmatic reformers. You know, you got to come up with catchy names for these guys. And these were the folks that shared a lot with the traditional greens, but they did kind of feel like environmental problems could be solved through institutional government structures and mainstream capitalism. So these are like the Jeffrey Sachs of the world who think that green capitalism, cradle to cradle kind of stuff, we can do some tweaks and solve environmental problems through what we already have. I also found the eco-modernists, which, of course, we'll talk about more. 
Well, these folks have faith in the ability of technology and large-scale action, less faith in sort of the power of individual behavior, very sort of optimistic, not very catastrophic, but a group that statistically differed from the other three groups dramatically. And then finally, the group that I thought was the most interesting that hasn't shown up in some other similar studies, and I kind of dubbed them the eco-fatalists. So these folks were extremely ethnically diverse. They tended to be younger. They were very, very well-informed about environmental problems. They were really concerned about them, but they believed that nothing could be done outside the level of the individual. But I would love to explore at some point the degree to which these folks have sort of experienced a systematic injustice in other ways and therefore are kind of just like, yeah, there's no way anything's going to fix this. So I'm just going to live in my yurt and do whatever I can and kind of hope for the best but not hope too hard. So that was what I found. And there's other studies that show different stuff. The only thing I would add to that would be I think there's definitely a very radical primitivist or anti-civilization perspective. Now, that's very minoritarian, but the influence that these people have is, is quite significant ideologically, I think. Then on the other side, I think I would add that there is an emerging sort of group of environmental intellectuals within what I guess is emerging as environmental humanities. And this is very much, these are academics, tend to not be informed by energy systems or engineering or conservation biology or climate science, but very much from literature or political science or sociology. And there's a raft of books that are coming out now from these sorts of people. And I find that really kind of interesting. Yeah, I think everything that's been said makes a lot of sense. I mean, all I would add is that, I mean, I've never actually really thought that systematically about what would be the taxonomy of environmental movement or scene, but I think there's sort of key principles that people line up around, and many of which have already been like, articulated and touched on. But one is the role of the state, the other one is the role of the market, and then the role of the individual. All this has been ID'd. And then I think a key thing is also sort of what is nature, right? And within yeah. eco-modernism, this is the eco-modernist podcast, I think there's a kind of left and right to this sort of sensibility. But I think there's a big divide throughout environmental thinking around what is nature? Is nature a thing that existed or exists without human beings and civilization and we are intruders? Or are we, as a species, like all other species, in fact, environment makers? And if you yeah. accept that we're environment makers and we're part of nature, then the kind of classic reification of nature as other becomes much more problematic and the set of solutions suggested becomes very different. If you believe that nature is this reified other and we are the intruders, then the solution is retreat. But if you think of human beings as being part of the environment and like all species being environment makers, then the question is, okay, well, what kind of environment are we going to make? Us environment makers, or are we going to continue despoiling it and threaten the existence of life on Earth with catastrophic runaway climate change? And I think that's really hard for a lot of people to sort of grapple with. And I'd be interested to hear what other people think about this. I find that when this is suggested to people, a huge burden is lifted from them. And they realize, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Like human beings make environments the same way beavers make environments and other animals. Exactly. And so a human civilization is a huge problem, but that's not our only record, right? I mean, human beings have increased biodiversity the way Native Americans the landscape in the northeast to increase edge habitat, these sorts of things. Like, we are definitely always a robust presence in the environment. Let's own it and steer it in the right direction. The idea of there being a natural balance upon which humans are intruding itself is, sets up this very division between nature and humanity. And, you know, a lot of it isn't very ecologically informed to begin with, in that there is certainly a lack of understanding of disasters that have happened in the deep geological past long before humans were on the scene. At the opening of my book, I talk about the great oxygenation event 2.5 billion years ago as a result of the emergence of free oxygen on a grand scale in the, the atmosphere. It resulted in the very first mass extinction event. And almost all organisms at that point, which were, of course, bacterial, but oxygen to be toxic. And so most of them died off. Basically, this resulted in the very first snowball earth, which then even impacted the cyanobacteria themselves. And this has happened over and over again. There's been so many different stages throughout the history of life on Earth where, as Christian says, 
other organisms are being ecosystem engineers. We are not the first ones to do this. There is a subtle difference between us and the rest of nature in that the rest of the organisms had no choice. We can realize, oh, the combustion of fossil fuels is harming us as in the long term, and the species upon which we depend on, we can choose not to do that. That is a radical difference. But at the same time, it is also just another example of how life transforms the world. Yeah, no, really, really good points, well Christian and Lee. I, I think we're going to have a hard time disagreeing. So there's a huge literature on the way in which this idea of nature is separate in the sense that it's sort of this walled off wilderness that when humans touch it, we totally screw it up. That's very sort of culturally and historically specific. Bill Cronin's classic book, Changes in the Land, does a great job of documenting the way in which when folks came over from England, we looked at these landscapes that were much less transformed than those in England, but saw them as pristine when in fact they'd been modified by Native American tribes for generations. And when they're done right, yeah, they look really quote unquote natural, but in fact, it was that sort of very sort of gentle, sensitive gardening. So that's kind of one of those things that does give me faith that when we engage with landscapes, it doesn't always have to be detrimental. And we have these historical examples of ways in which humans have done it and have done it right. It was just the problem was that certain groups of people mistook doing it right for keeping our hands off and not touching it at all. But that creates great things like national parks, and it creates really problematic things like thinking that national parks are the only way that we're going to sort of set our relationship right. And the fact that climate is making it so that the animals that live in national parks are migrating north makes all these questions so much more complicated right now. It does seem like one of the origins of that reification of nature comes from that moment of disrupting the ecology of the commons that Peter Linebaugh has written about well in a book that I don't think has gotten enough attention called the Magna Carta Manifesto. There's a second half of the Magna Carta, which is the Charter of the Forest. And his argument is that the Magna Carta wasn't just a political agreement between the, the barons and king, but it was also a sort of an environmental settlement between all the classes and it, it preserved certain elements of common and defined a different set of property relations where there was access to certain portions of the forest by certain classes of people, like peasants had the right of tannage to graze their pigs in forests that weren't theirs to control completely. So they might ultimately be recognized as the private property of a lord, but they had use rights over it or Westover, I think it was called, was the right of widows to collect the branches that had fallen from trees, regardless of who the ultimate owner of the property was. Just something to kind of put out there. Yeah, no, I think this is really crucial. My analysis, in terms of my critique of degrowth and anti-consumerist politics, uh, ultimately comes from that I think they're mistaking the, the source of the problem, which is, in their mind, growth or expansion or effectively greater human intervention within nature, rather than the market. In terms of the Magna Carta, what I find fascinating about that, effectively what's happening there is a decommodification or a recommoning of resources. And, but today we should be saying the same sort of thing, that the resolution to these issues, the primary difficulty that we face is that within the market, so long as something is profitable, no matter how harmful that commodity is, in the absence of some non-market intervention, that commodity will continue to be produced. Now, sometimes that intervention could be regulation, sometimes it's trade union pressure, sometimes it's people power, whatever it happens to be, but it's something that is not in the market. If left to its own devices, it continue to produce a harmful commodity so long as it is profitable. There's a real resonance between an expansion of the public sphere and expansion of the commons. There's a real resonance of what we need to do today and what you were just suggesting was this other side of the Magna Carta so many hundreds of years ago. What we're talking about is a process of rolling back commodification to sort of recommonize more and more of the world should be public goods, should be, be publicly regulated, and should be not for sale. And, and I think that then brings us back to the question of the state, right? Not that everything has to be done by the government. I mean, there can be community norms around this to say, you know, here you will not dig up ore and dump your trash or whatever. But, but ultimately, in a modern society, it does require the power of the law to say, yeah, this is not for sale. You are not allowed to drill holes in the earth here. You are not allowed to produce this type of fuel that pollutes the atmosphere. And 
to incrementally close off more and more of reality to the ravages of commodification and the market. And if, if we think of building environmental solutions and building socialism in a more incremental fashion like that, it's not as dramatic and romantic as the great overthrow, but it, yeah. I think, gives people a serious purchase on how to act now in real time in meaningful ways. I think that Carl Polanyi is very useful in this regard. He's a book, Great Transformation. He argues that if everything did have a price tag on it and, and we had a fully market society, society would collapse into total anarchy and environmental chaos. Yeah, I agree, Christian. And I kind of feel like it's one of these kind of devil's bargains. Some of what I've been getting into lately, I talk a lot about unpaid labor and the degree to which unpaid labor needs to be valued more. I've always been sort of torn within the realm of things like environmental economics, which want to put a price tag on all these ecosystem services. And it sounds really good when it works, but what if you do all the accounting and you find out it actually is better to just cut this forest down? And then it's kind of like, for me personally, I'm like, whoa, 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 wait, I was just playing that game because I wanted it to be worth more when we priced it out. <laughs> and I think we know that in our own lives, the things that are the most valuable to us are the things that we really couldn't find a price tag for, so that our grandmas gave us or something that was sentimental. So once you start to play that game, it can get really problematic and can create these sort of unintended consequences. What if we just preserved nature, you know, because we like it? And it makes our lives better and it makes us happy. And we relax a little bit and let go of this need to make everything that we value the most economically rational thing to do and sort of just have confidence that we like these green spaces because they're good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think yeah. That's, that's a really great point. A, a society that it is democratically coordinated, that is planned, that diminishes as much as possible markets and change values, we are able to have a conversation in our democratic spaces about these other values that may not have a particular price or are actually very difficult or impossible to price. Lake, could you speak a little bit about eco-austerity? Sure, yeah. So whenever we engage in any sort of struggle for social or environmental justice, we should always be very, very careful that we don't import some very bad ideas sometimes. sometimes. I think, you know, the history of the, the Soviet Union is, is a great example of that. And there's been many, many times where we on the left get things wrong. And, and my concern is that as we struggle, rightly as we should be doing, to put an end to the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis, we should be careful that we don't unconsciously import some neoliberalism or other enlightenment and, and reactionary ideas. And primarily my concern is around anti-consumerism and degrowth, all of these are basically forms of eco-austerity. If you look over the last 40 years in what most Western countries, working people's wages have stagnated or barely grown. And this is true in the United States, this is true in Britain, this is true in Western Europe. And so for anybody to, to come around and say, we, all of us, including working people, are consuming too much. I wonder who the hell are they talking to? We aren't consuming enough. We need uh, much higher wages. Every time the trade union or group of workers goes into battle with their employers to try to recapture as much of the value that they've created to ha have higher wages, they will then spend that money on more things. And conversely, if we take on board the fact that we should be consuming less, we all working people should be consuming less, well, that gives a really nice sort of ideological support to the boss when the boss says, I'm sorry, I can't pay you more because you already consume too much. There's a, a sort of unthinking Thatcherism at the heart of these ideas. And fundamentally, as I was saying a few minutes ago, it mistakes the real villain, which is the commodity form or the market, basically. The market is the source of the problem. If you're spending all your time trying to convince everybody to consume less, and you're not paying attention to the fact that the solutions that the sort of neoliberal greens come up with, which is ever more marketization of ever more commodification, you're letting the villain off the hook. Now, some people say, well, we're fighting those things as well. Okay, but you're, you still haven't done your due diligence in terms of your analysis of what the source of the problem is.
study out in June, I think it was, half of Americans can't afford enough food to eat or pay their rent, the basic necessities. How dare Greens say that they are consuming too much? It's just so bizarre. Another problem with the personal consumption is that it, it reiterates this idea, this sort of methodological individualism that is prevalent in at least American environmentalism. And, and that can be very confusing for people. They think that the problem is that everybody consumes too much and therefore the solution is that everybody needs to, in a kind of semi-religious fashion, reform and consume morally. And what gets obscured in that is like the social structures in which we're all embedded, the state, the corporate form, the laws. And if people aren't looking at the collective social structure, that's very depoliticizing to think that the solution to collective problems is just the aggregation of a bunch of individual moral acts. I mean, it is the essence of depoliticization. Exactly. Well, I wanted to say that in Lee's book, one of my favorite parts was when he talked about Buy Nothing Day and the Buy Nothing movement. Because when I was sort of coming of age and becoming critical of capitalism and that kind of stuff, I thought Buy Nothing was really kind of the big solution. A buy Nothing Day, it's more of a European quote-unquote holiday happens the day after Thanksgiving, when it's this idea, it's sort of counter to Black Friday. It's sort of taken on by Adbusters Magazine, was really into it for a while there. And so this was really important to me. It was kind of like, how do we stop this? We just stop buying so much stuff. And then I think it was, as I got older and read more and thought more, I realized that one of the reasons that I could buy nothing on that day is because I'd bought everything I needed the day before. Basically, I just think there's a real sense of privilege with this ability to give things up and practice this sort of anti-consumerism degrowth movement. What I love about Jennifer's work, if you could jump in here, Jennifer, is where I'm sort of worried about the green movement has adopted some anti-working class ideas. I love how your work is doing the same sort of thing, but like, uh uh-oh, are we embracing some actually quite misogynist ideas as well? Yeah. I mean, I think what Lee's referring to is a paper I wrote and something I've been talking about lately, which is this idea as to whether or not environmentalism takes women's concerns seriously. This was one of these things that I'd both sort of studied academically, but I was a mom, I had two young kids, and I was sort of feeling really torn between my identity sort of as a feminist. I wanted to keep working on my doctorate and get a job and all that kind of stuff. But also, on the other hand, feeling like my environmental brethren were telling me that I should be spending all Sunday going to the farmer's market and pureeing my own baby food and then washing diapers and why wasn't I riding a bike? Basically, women all over the world do the vast majority of unpaid labor. And unpaid labor also takes place close to the home and in shorter chunks of time. So this is going to give you less time to go and do a tree sit, or maybe that's the more radical version. Men are doing a lot more work than they used to, but if you have the responsibility for this unpaid labor, we're at a time where luckily we have enough modernization to be able to do these sort of household tasks more quickly and easily than ever. And we've got the Greens who are kind of saying, actually, you need to do this in a way that takes twice as long and is twice as hard. And if you don't, you're not a good environmentalist. I think that us Greens can be kind of blind to the way in which our prescriptions affect different economic and ethnic and sociodemographic groups differently. One of the things that I always found interesting in my piece was bicycling, because women ride bikes as transportation at about one-third the rate of men. And there was some good surveys that were done about what are the barriers to you biking more. And a lot of the time it's sort of chalked up to women wanting to look presentable at work. But when you look at it, actually men and women report the same levels of wanting to look presentable at work. So that's not it. And then you can also look at fear and fear of the dark, which there are discrepancies between both genders. And I think that's totally understandable and reasonable and justifiable. But where I think the most interesting differences are is the need to carry passengers and the responsibility for grocery shopping. I mean, that's it. And putting groceries and kids on a bike and doing those tasks within the sort of smaller temporal time frames that are required for that unpaid labor falls disproportionately on one gender. And I think that as screens, we often think it's about, well, we just need people to care more about nature. And I'm saying, no, actually, in this case, it's just that both genders need to be equally responsible for groceries. 
I say this as a lifelong environmentalist, I think we can be kind of blind as to the way in which caring about the environment is rarely the barrier to sort of acting in pro-environmental ways. I'm kind of relatively upper class white woman. I'm the one that has it the easiest. And when you think about folks who have uncertain work schedules and are commuting by public transportation, there needs to be a, a greater awareness on our part as to the way in which our prescriptions for especially these lifestyle behaviors aren't accessible to different groups. And can we address the structures that make them inaccessible rather than hammering these symbolic and largely sort of affinity group oriented behaviors? These days, what's more important, the individual or a collective you hit the nail on the head there, Rick. I think that one of the things that marries both the neoliberal greens and some of the sort of degrowth, anti-consumer stuff is this emphasis on the individual as the source of change. Whereas if we're talking about some of the grand scale infrastructural Green New Deal development that we need to do this, we have to stop thinking of ourselves as, as individuals. We have to think of ourselves as, as citizens, as, as collectivities organized in movements to put pressure on government to build out the mass clean infrastructure that we need. I think that the really great example for me recently is about five years ago, Norway, a relatively social democratic country, decided that they were going to euthanize in internal combustion engines as rapidly as possible. And rather than wait for the private sector to build out fast charging stations only in the cherry picked regions where they could make money, as Tesla is doing, the public sector just built out that infrastructure across the, the entirety of the country. And the country is quite mountainous and it's quite northerly, so this is not a, a small endeavor to do this. They instituted a whole series of subsidies and perks, like it, it's free to take a ferry if you have an electric vehicle, it's free to park anywhere in the country if you have an electric vehicle. All of these things were achieved through the public sector. That is voters acting as, as a movement, as, as a collective of citizens rather than as individual consumers delivered this. And as of January this year, as of January 2018, more than 50% of all new vehicles sold are electric. That's incredible. The region in the world, the, the jurisdiction in the world that is the next closest to that is California at just under 3%. So, wow. and, and Norway did this in just over five years. We can do this. France almost completely nuclearized its electricity from the mid-1970s to early 1980s. As they say in French, a grand projet d'état, a great project of state. And the only reason that it didn't go all the way was basically by the mid-1980s, European community energy liberalization prevented them from doing this. The market can't do it. That The scale of upfront investment would be so huge. No market actor would do it without significant public subsidies or price guarantees, and in which case, why don't we just do it through a public sector anyway, because it'd be much cheaper. Taking the, the, the technologies from the lab bench through to commercialization, it, the private sector just will not do this. It will take us acting not as individuals, but as, as voters in a community, in a movement, to achieve all this. So you sort of suggested that voting will do it, but it seems to me that's too, too weak to be able to it accomplish. Is. I mean, uh, I would say that the, the current structures whether we're talking about the United States or Great Britain or Canada, they're as democratic as they are uh, compared to, say, China or Qatar or Saudi Arabia, there's still insufficient democracy. Voting shouldn't be fetishized. Neither should we say that's enough nor think that we're encouraging them and we shouldn't do it by voting. But you know, clearly there has to be protests, right? And elected officials rise to the occasion when there are mass movements forcing them to mm -hmm. do the right thing. Let's not forget that Richard Nixon was the president who presided over the creation of the EPA and Clean Air Act, Clean Water yeah. Act. Those are very, very significant laws. I would just say that he was being pressured from the civil rights movement. There were a lot of different movements at the time that were asking that society be restructured in, in a much more threatening way than the environment. And that's kind of part of this legacy of the environment is sort of nice upper-class, sort of genteel activity. 
And you mentioned the first Earth Day. It's funny because when you look back into Robert Gottlieb, the Forcing the Spring, um, the 1993 book that I just think is fabulous, it talks about how environmentalism before the 1970s was actually a movement that was very urban in nature. And Rachel Carson was as concerned for marine wildlife as she was for the degree to which ocean pollution and urban pollution affected human populations. What happened, as I understood it, with Earth Day was that there was this sort of need to aggregate the movement into a single voice. And they alienated like some of the old conservationists um, who kind of were like, actually, this is working fine. You know, Audubon Society, Sierra Club, those kind of folks. And they also alienated a lot of the folks that were doing really good work in cities. And the media found out about it and sort of said, oh my goodness, look, environmentalism just started existing out of nowhere in 1970. And in fact, there were a lot of strains that were happening before then that kind of got effectively silenced by the popularization that happened on that Earth Day. I'm not trying to denigrate how important that was and how much amazing legislation it brought forth. But environmentalism had been extremely diverse and had existed a long time before that and has remain diverse since, and I actually think that's one of the strengths rather than one of the weaknesses. Non-governmental organizations sort of take up the slack when democracy fails, and not all of them are good, but I think they do succeed in a lot of ways. What do you think of that? I don't want to denigrate NGOs. Some, some of my best friends work in NGOs. Um, <laughs> but, and I think that there's a great danger of the NGOification of the left that has happened over the last 20, 30 years. NGOs are very much shell outfits. There's a great danger of them mirroring the hollowing out of democracy that we've seen in other parts of society as well. Yeah, on their own, way too top down. They're way too, way top, too top down. down. Absolutely. Yes, I think new NGOs at their best when they're deeply rooted, when they have a community that controls them democratically, and they're a ma genuine mass organization, I think they can be a wonderful force for good in the, in the world. So Greenpeace isn't a, a mass democratic organization. I think Friends of the Earth is, and I think Friends of the Earth comes out with some more interesting positions sometimes because of that, that they change their perspective, they debate ideas. They can be great, but it's, the problem is the top-down nature of this also involves like financial dependence on foundations, which is to say the yeah. wealth of the 1%. And intentionally or unintentionally, what foundations do to NGOs is in many ways absorb the best and the brightest, identify the leadership class, and then give them these little make-work jobs competing against each other for grants. Yeah. My wife ran an NGO for a number of years, and she went into it with her eyes open. But it was an incredible inside look at just how deeply – deranged and destructive this whole foundation-funded model of NGOs can be. The main thing is like this endless competition against each other, having to like read the minds of the funders, and they, I mean, they control the discourse. For example, the ways we're discussing viewing these problems are usually quite excluded, and this is a really insidious way of controlling movements. Not to say all NGOs are bad, but that foundation-funded model rather than a membership base is very dangerous. I have been around these people my entire adult life. I taught and traveling for over a decade as a journalist in the Global South. I mean, I cannot stand the culture of these do-gooders who get this foundation money and want to have it both ways. And they want to have a nice job and they want it to be meaningful, and they want everyone to like them because they're doing something righteous. And it's just, it inculcates a kind of egotism and hypocrisy, and it achieves very little, and it actually even demobilizes people, I think. I worked in Brussels for a number of years covering the European Union, and green NGOs are very much integrated into the extra-democratic structures of the European Union. Sorry, one person told me, I won't say which NGO this was, but that People were getting concerned around what's dying off of bees. And the marketing department of the NGO was like, this is great, you know, people love bees, they're so cuddly, and but this is awesome. And the, you know, the researchers in the organization came back and said, well, honestly, at the moment, we don't really know why this is happening. We have our suspicions around some pesticides, so we aren't clear exactly what it is yet. And the marketing people basically overrode what the researchers in the organization were saying around the uncertainty about this because they realized that this was a great 
way to raise money. And NGOs, in a very sort of isolated way, absent from or insulated from mass movements, which can independently keep an organization going without the need for foundation funding or even very much money. A mass organization can maintain itself and be insulated from those sorts of problems. But instead, because they see, well, this is going to make a lot of money, they effectively are no different from corporations at that point. They exist to exist. Mm -hmm. But what NGOs do well, I think, is they gather people together and educate them. But Rick, they can also gather people together and miseducate them. They yeah. define the terms of like, we're not going to talk about inequality, we're going to talk about poverty. But how many times have we heard mentioned from people in senior positions within green NGOs who recognize that nuclear power needs to play a role within the energy mix if we're going to go for deep decarbonization, but they constantly say, well, I can't come out publicly because we will lose all our funding. Yes, 350. Yeah. Well, I would disagree in that I think I agree you can create safe atomic power plants, but they're extremely expensive. And the situation we have now in the United States, at least, is we have this discourse of they're going, there's going to be a nuclear renaissance. But instead, what we have is this old fleet that is leaking and not being properly dealt with. The federal government has put enormous amounts of subsidies on the table, and the private sector isn't willing to shoulder any of the risks. So it, it seems pretty clear you can have extremely expensive, quite safe atomic power, but it's going to have to be completely state subsidized. There's no new plan has come in on time or on budget. And the time frame of climate change is so intensely compressed that I think we really need to push renewables. You can't use it. I mean, back in the 80s, Cuba flew $3 billion at the time building maybe 75% of a new plant. You guys also have to deal with stuff like, you know, Westinghouse going bankrupt over this Georgia new plant. There's another question around atomic infrastructure, which is sea level rise and these old nuke plants. So I don't think that it's actually that practical. With nuclear, we don't need to worry about the radiation the way that we thought we did. We can recycle most of the waste. That is not the issue that we thought it was. And that meltdown with advanced reactors ceases to be a problem and provides baseload power that variable renewables don't. That we're not going to solve the climate crisis without nuclear. I just don't see it. Yeah, I think it's an impossibility, actually. The IPCC says the same thing. Germany spent $800 billion, roughly, to build their renewable infrastructure. And the two of the last four years, they've led the EU in CO2 emissions. They lead the EU in debts from coal pollution. Yeah, absolutely. I, I find conversations about the nuclear renaissance boring because they've been going on for so long. So my position on this is like, knock yourselves out. If you can get the funding to do it, do it. But that doesn't seem to be happening. Well, I'm not quite ready to jump into the nuclear versus renewables thing, but I will say that there's a long history of environmentalism not always supporting and promoting science. This isn't anything new. If you go back and you look at the Marine Mammal Protection Act, there was a lot of debate between environmental groups and scientists. Scientists basically saying, we want limited taking so that we can study these species and move the science forward. And basically, the big debates, in, this is 1972, I think, when they were negotiating the MMPA, was between environmentalists who wanted no takings and scientists who wanted takings. It's just one example of the way in which green groups have ascribed more to sort of an ideological framework that has to do with sort of culturally held conceptions of nature and what's right and what's wrong than science. So I guess I'm just not that surprised to hear that an NGO would support maybe ambiguous science <laughs> because it is, it's hard to sell ambiguity. And there's a long history of environmentalism bracing perspectives that are inconsistent with science. And we can see that's the same today with things like, with things like GMOs. The building out of old clean energy infrastructure, right? We shouldn't think of it as merely like a loss. We don't have money. First of all, the crisis of capitalism is that there's too much capital and it needs places to be invested. The process of building all this stuff out is going to create economic growth, generate income that can then be taxed and actually pay for itself. So I'm saying that if your problem with nuclear was that it was super expensive and I'm saying, well, the storage solutions that you're talking about are no less expensive.
my problem with nuclear is not that it's too expensive, but that it, it's too expensive for anyone to seem to engage with it. And it's like my position is like, knock yourselves out. Do it if you can. But then the question is, look, why isn't it happening? It's not happening in this country because Wall Street wants nothing to do with it. Well, I guess one of the things I just wanted to ask was growing up as an environmentalist, you kind of starting out as an earth first during the mid-90s. Some of the early movements I was involved in were really anti-hydro. And it's been so interesting sort of seeing the way and we're kind of unproblematically these days accepting hydro and maybe not having the kind of conversations that I remember us having around it. I'm an academic to kind of say, I just study things, I don't have opinions, then I can keep my mind open as long as I want and just keep learning. I've been doing that and I've tried to figure out the numbers myself. I've listened and I've heard all of this about what kind of a mix do we need and what do we need to get to where we want to go. You know, if carbon emissions are your bottom line, then you're going to be facing some tough questions. I guess what's hard for me, and this is because I study social movements and people, I'm not an energy economist, that's not what I do. But I'll go to a conference and we'll be talking about sustainable energy and renewable energy and what renewable seems like code words for what we're going to talk about and what we're not going to talk about. So I don't know. I remain open-minded. But I do think that if carbon emissions are our bottom line, I think it's at least something that we should discuss rather than have these events where we'll be talking about energy for, for days on end and no one even mentions nuclear. So I think it should be on the table and I think it should be discussed and so that's about as far as my expertise lets me go with that. <laughs> Brought back to what we were talking about before, there's so many other conversations that happen elsewhere in terms of litigating the rule of nuclear and I'm not really interested in that. What I'm interested in with respect to eco-modernism, I mean one of the questions that you had in your list you sent to us, Gabe, was are you an eco-modernist? And I was like, I'm, well, I'm not. I'm just a plain vanilla socialist. And one of the reasons I'm not is when they talk about the role of nuclear, I'm with them, but because they're nonpartisan. They don't take a position on the market. They don't take a position on Republican or Democrat or socialist. And precisely because of the costs involved with the build-out of nuclear, it's going to have to be public or it's not going to happen. I mean, maybe one day when we have small modular reactors built on assembly lines instead of on site, and you're getting these economies of scale or economies of, of numbers, where you begin to get them as cheap as solar panels and, and wind turbines, then maybe, yeah, maybe then the private sector can take over. And between now and the glorious day where that happens, there's no choice, but nuclear has to be public. And that means that we're going to have to be partisan. We can't be nonpartisan about this. Nuclear means backing the public sector. I wanted to make a little point with to kind of just condemn eco-modernism because it's not left per se is kind of throwing a baby out with the bathwater. No, I get the, the role that they're playing. I think it's very, very important that one needs to be able to speak beyond uh, one's comfort zone. I know a lot of the people involved with some in the eco-modernist movement and a lot of, to be honest, are liberal left anyway. There are very few conservatives, although there are some, and they sort of hide their liberal lefty under a bushel because they you want to work with conservatives who are pro-nuclear or work with conservatives who are pro-GMO, and that's great. Absolutely. I will march arm in arm with conservatives in defense of nuclear as well. But to be honest, like if we are going to achieve this one thing that we all really do want to see, you know, build out of a global fleet of nuclear, I just don't see any way around having a tough conversation about the role of the public sector. And when you have that conversation, things do shake out to a left and right sort of point of view, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, though I think a lot of conservative uh, eco-modernists I spoke to make exceptions for nuclear power. Well, you know, so, they, they make exceptions for, for, for the Pentagon as well. The Pentagon is completely yeah, a lot public of things, sector. A lot of things, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can't be an ideologue. I think on any, either left or right, you cannot. I agree, that. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Eco-modernism is largely about technology. I guess yeah, the technologies don't exist outside of social relations. And a Christian was quite right that the upfront capital costs are, are huge at the moment for conventional nuclear. And because of those costs, the social relations around who has the money, who, who can engage in, in such investments, are private actors sufficiently not risk averse? So nuclear on its own exists within this web of, of political economy, of social relations that we can't ignore. We can't just say we're pro-nuclear and then say, well, it doesn't matter what the social and economic relations around that are. 
because it, it doesn't nuclear doesn't exist in a in a social vacuum. I agree with you completely on that point. Obviously, the biggest impediment to the expansion and even the continuation of nuclear power is public fear. And the public is doubly afraid if nuclear power plants are controlled by private enterprise because they're concerned that profits will take precedent over safety. Exactly. We're going to have to be partisan. We can't be nonpartisan about this. Nuclear means backing the public sector, backing anti-austerity politics. It means resisting the argument that carbon taxation will solve everything, that we need public infrastructure, that we need a Green New Deal. And my frustration is that the people that are most best suited to be developing the nuclear renaissance are the democratic socialists because they are more public sector oriented. Ironically, at the same time, these are the people that are most fervently anti-nuclear. Like Bernie Sanders. I mean, I wrote an article in The New Republic a few years ago when Bernie was running. And of course, Bernie is anti-nuclear. Convinced, I don't want to attack other leftists or other Greens for being anti-nuclear. What I want is I want to convince them that we're, uh, one, that we should be pro-nuclear, and two, that we're the best ones to build it up, because I just don't think that we're going to solve the climate crisis without nuclear. I just don't see it. In the meantime, you guys also have to deal with stuff like, you know, Westinghouse going bankrupt over this, like, Georgia nuke plant. Not the future of what could be with socialized energy policies, but there's also this Absolutely. question here, like, what, you know, what's happening now, and does, is it reasonable under this system, which is a market system, right? And we've been talking about being socialist and stuff like that. And it's one of the contradictions in this is that we have to deal with the fact that it is this society and these institutions that, that have to do, maybe not all of the build out, but a significant part of the, of the build out of the clean energy sector. And that sends socialists with a, a contradiction. It means we have to really think about how to engage in real time with the private sector, to use state policy to push it in towards decarbonization as quickly as possible. And this picks up on a point you were making earlier, Lays, about increasing the consumption. It's like, in a way, what we have to do is increase the energy content of everything, but make sure that that energy is increasingly clean. One of the ways to push back against the kind of eco-pessimism, eco-austerity, is to remind people that actually there is one resource that is infinite, and that is energy. And our challenge at a macro level is not to reduce our consumption of energy, but actually to increase the energy content of everything as long as that energy is clean. And that is not a physical impossibility. I'm going to put this last question, and that is what are the prospects for environmentalism going forward? It's a good question, and it's a hard one. Things look rough. At the same time, again, without being patronizing, you can look at a lot of social psychology research, Rob Willer's work for one, that shows that when people become scared and fatalistic, they retreat into themselves and they protect their family and they don't sort of engage in broader ways that are more effective. But I think it's important that we differentiate between what problems are solvable on the individual scale and what aren't and not conflate them. I think that that's also contingent on there being sort of an openness to ambiguity and confusion and being willing to sort of entertain that these problems are happening at multiple scales at once, which I think is really hard. But the degree to which we can say, I don't know, I'm still learning, I'm not sure, I feel conflicted about this, I think that can maybe at least at the level of the individual kind of open ourselves up to entertaining more possibilities and engaging in ways that can be sort of more collective and ideally more broadly effective? I would say I'm actually quite optimistic. I think that the greatest challenge to resolving the climate crisis is neoliberalism. I think the inability of us to regulate the move away from fossil fuels and other issues within cement and agriculture and so on and so forth, that's the fundamental barrier. But that doesn't just affect environmentalism. The neoliberal embrace of the market as opposed to democratic planning, is something that is hitting us in terms of healthcare. It's hitting us in terms of lack of trade unions. It's hitting us in terms of cuts to social services. It's hitting us in terms of stagnant wages. It's hitting us in terms of low productivity and stagnant economies and economic crisis, 2008 and so forth. And the reason I'm optimistic for the first time in a long time is that 
since 2008, I think we have seen some significant transformations in the political discourse. The reality of, of Bernie Sanders, an open socialist, getting so close to Democratic presidential nomination. I think it's an absolutely amazing thing, the fact that Democratic Socialists of America have over 50,000 members. It's stunning. I think the fact that Jeremy Corbyn is, is perhaps months away from power in the UK. It, these are incredibly optimistic moments. At the same time, I don't want to be Pollyannish. I think neoliberalism remains a great threat. I think the, the rise of the far right in Eastern Europe and Italy and France these are really great dangers, but I really think that the solution with respect to, to those is more of what I've just talked about with respect to the Bernie Sanderses of the world and the Jeremy Corbyns and so on and so forth. And that goes with the climate issues as well. It's not reducing consumption. It's getting us to act more democratically as a collective and a re-embrace of the public sector and infrastructure, I think. We can do this. We know we have the technology to eliminate about roughly 80 to 90 percent of, of greenhouse gas emissions. By the time we've got that, hopefully we can solve the, the other part. But it will take a turn to the public. Honestly, I think the prospects of civilization dealing with climate change are, are pretty grim, pretty limited. I think it's going to be, as everyone on this, we're locked in for major social and economic disruptions in the best case scenario. But that's the easy case to make. The easy case to make intellectually is we're doomed. The difficult case to make credibly, and it has to be made credibly, is no, we have the technology to do this, to get out of this crisis we created for ourselves. And we do. We have the money, we have the technology, we have the laws. We just have to mobilize and develop the political will and the discourse around it. So I don't want to be Pollyannish. I think chances are that's going to be very, very, very hard to do, but I am not bright-siding by saying it is not impossible. Listen, thanks so much, folks. It was really wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, and now for our final thoughts. If there is one thing in our modern age that is worth celebrating and defending is our newfound respect and tolerance for diversity. But our biggest problem is that we have not gone far enough. The great irony of our times is that while we will fight tooth and nail for tolerance and respect towards the diversity of people with different races, nationalities, and religious beliefs, we fall woefully short in the tolerance for people with different secular views and ideas. In short, we have been all too quick to not only accept intolerance, but even to acquiesce to those among us with the attitude that there are two sides to every question, my side and the wrong side. There's no doubt that many treasured totems of both right and left have been knocked over today. Many listeners might be offended, but rather than being offended, we should be open and welcoming to hearing views that, whether we agree with them or not, are intended to move humanity forward. Just as there is no progress without struggle, there can be no progress without controversy as well. The only way we will truly be free is when we learn to open our minds and hearts. And that's it for our show today. This is Gabe Ignetti. And this is Rick Maltese. We'll be seeing you till next time.